So I don't know about you, but I really enjoyed this morning's uh, lectures about uh, uh, reinforcement learning. But I'm just warning you that uh, today we're going to talk about something completely different. I am um, going to mostly be talking about, uh, um, you know, su subject, uh, the, you know, the problem of, of theoretical chemistry. And my hopes uh, from this talk is that I can convince you it's an interesting problem. And I can show you that there are opportunities for applying machine learning uh, in, a fund you know, in a way which is fundamentally interesting and valuable. And to maybe, um, I've, I've tried to find some uh, common, um, common themes of uh, uh, problems in, in, uh, in ML, but you know, that's maybe less important. So first of all, I'm, you know, I'm there in the middle, but this is the work is of a whole team of people. So you know, I'm just putting everyone's pictures here so that I've acknowledged everyone and um, you know that it's not just my work. <laughs> But, um, and I also wanted to underline what are the recurrent machine learning themes that I will be talking about. And I think that there are three important factors. One is identifying really important uh, stuff that has to be respected and that has to be baked into the model. The second thing is uh, how do you translate an intuition about a problem into something you can put in a neural network? So it, it's not going to be baked in. It's not like a fixed rule, but it's something that, uh, that you think is a part of the problem. Uh, and finally, I hope this will be, be clear that the, the, the really important thing is to uh, benchmark and test your model correctly with uh, whatever is the, the correct thing in the field you're working in. I think maybe this doesn't make sense now, but hopefully it will be in your mind and it will make sense as the talk goes on. So the first thing I want to convince you about is that you should care about electrons. Um, <clears throat> the work that I do, this, the work of uh, uh, quantum chemistry, is all about understanding electrons. But, you know, it's just gone the afternoon. I don't know about you. Maybe you feel a bit sleepy. An important question is also, you know, how long, how do you make the perfect roast of coffee? What turns, uh, you know, uh, uh, coffee bitter versus uh, nice? And the answer is chemistry. Uh, you know, the coffee bean contains some, uh, some substance, that molecule to the left. And basically roasting it means you warm it up in a dry atmosphere. And if you do it just long enough, you transform the molecule into the one to the right, which tastes nice. But if you do it for too long, you'll degrade the molecule and you'll get something which tastes nasty. But, you know, how long do you have to warm it up uh, how fast does each of these reactions happen? What temperature does it happen at? Uh, how do the atoms uh, reorganize? Why do they make, make one molecule and not another one? Why does the one to the right taste nasty and the one in the middle taste nice? All of these questions and many more ultimately boil down to the behavior of electrons. And yeah, it's not just about coffee, right? You could, uh, you could say, how do I make a fertilizer? How do I make uh, ammonia from nitrogen? How do I stuff lots of lithium in a, in a cathode of a battery? How do I capture light in a solar cell? What makes a material a superconductor? All of this boils down to how do the atoms behave. And ultimately, you might think, well, why, why aren't you talking about atoms there? So here I'm showing you the simplest chemical reaction, which is uh, H2 plus H going to H plus H2, so three hydrogen atoms and one of them is shuttling between the two. But really what, what drives the energetics between this, what glues matter together is electrons. So all of these important questions ultimately fundamentally boil down to the quantum mechanics of electrons. And this isn't just a, um, you know, a practically important problem if you want to make a nice cup of coffee. It's also, in my view, a, uh, um, um, a part of the arc of human understanding of what is the world made of. You know, like in the mid 19th century, uh, people had a pretty good idea of chemistry, like through the, through the centuries, they knew about what makes certain reactions. In the beginning of the 1900s, we discovered about subatomic particles, proteins, uh, uh, sorry, protons, uh, neutrons, electrons but we thought they were like billiard balls. And in the 1920s, uh, uh, you know, quantum mechanics was uh, 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 
was developed, which, which explains the behavior of matter, right? But I believe that the work we're on is still on this arc of understanding, which is still not complete. I will, I will show you. And so in 1929, uh, Paul Dirac, you know, uh, made this uh, statement at the time, famous statement, which is that the underlying physical laws necessary for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry is thus completely known. So it's fairly smug. He thought basically, job done. We've now solved every problem. But then he added another sentence that sometimes is not quoted. And the difficulty is only that the exact application of these loads leads to equations that are much too complicated to solve in practice. Uh, and so that, that sentence started a whole uh, exploration which has lasted, uh, I guess, about uh, 90 years now and which is still ongoing. And what I will be talking about today is using ML to continue this journey. So a bit more in detail, what is the problem? I've shown you this equation here and I'm gonna try and explain what these bits what these various pieces mean. Unlike uh, this morning, this is the only equation in the talk, by the way. So let's say that this was classical physics, you know, the, the stuff that you maybe learn in high school. Then you would say that atoms would be like billiard balls, you know, like uh, things with a definite position and a definite velocity, and the state of a system, the state uh, of the molecule in this case, is what I mean. Uh, would correspond to the position of all the nuclei and the position of all the electrons. This is a molecule of caffeine and it has 102 electrons. So you would need 102 vectors for the position of the um, electrons and 102 vectors for the velocity of the electrons. But according to quantum theory, the position and the velocity of the electrons is intrinsically uncertain. So you cannot define the state by defining their position you have to uh, define the, the state of the system by its wave function. And what the wave function corresponds to intuitively is that it, uh, it's something which, if you square it, it tells you the probability of finding electrons at certain positions, x1, x2, x3, x4. And so now it's this object, this wave function, which describes the state of the system, not the position of the individual electrons. Hope this makes sense. And when you do a computation, so when you apply this equation, the, this is Schrodinger's equation, in effect what you're doing is that you have to work out every possible configuration of electrons, and from that you average the entire, you know, every configuration has got a probability associated with it and an energy. You make that, 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 that uh, big um, expectation value or, you know, or uh, integral or whatever you want to call it, uh, and there you get the energy. And the problem is, you know, the problem is that it's super tough, right? Because say that you have 102 electrons and you just want to consider 10 possible positions for each one, you'd have to do 10 to the 102 uh, calculations, right? So the curse of dimensionality that we were talking about this morning applies big time to this problem. And that means that in practice, uh, you can only solve this equation exactly for systems that have got, uh, that have got um, maybe 10 electrons or less. For anything which has got, uh, you know, say 10 to 100 electrons, you have to use approximate methods. And for anything which has got more than 100 electrons, you need to sidestep this exponential complexity altogether and do something different. And basically, I'm going to be talking about two projects. One is called Quantum Monte Carlo, and it falls into the category of approximate methods. And the other one is called density functional approximation, and it falls into the sidestepping the exponential uh, box. So first, quantum Monte Carlo. <clears throat> so again, to go back to what I said before, if we know the wave function, we know everything. So if we know a certain molecule to study, we can translate this into an equation. And the idea is going to be that this equation is the, the Schrodinger equation I showed before. And uh, uh, the idea will be that uh, instead of uh, having, say, a tabular representation of the wave function, which, which would be exponentially large, we're going to represent the solution of the equation with a neural network. And one Im very important uh, factor is, uh, you might have heard about uh, Pauli's exclusion principle, the fact that two electrons can't be in the same place at the same time, roughly speaking, or in the same state at the same time. Um, the way that this appears mathematically 
is that the wave function must be anti-symmetric under the swapping of two electrons. So if you, you know, one, of, one property that's something, something anti-symmetric like, like this is that obviously if R1 and R2 are the same, then Psi must be zero, right? So that fact, together with the fact that swapping electron labels cannot change the probability, so cannot change the wave function squared, the only solution is that the wave function must be anti-symmetric. OK. And so the chief requirement, the thing that we need to bake into our neural network, is that uh, the whole thing has to be anti-symmetric with respect to swapping of electron labels. And this, I'm going to describe now how we achieve this. Imagine we take electron position and we put it through some uh, you know, boxes and arrows, some neural network, and then we do apply some other neural network uh, with another position and another one. Now, if these uh, operations, if these uh, hexagons are all encoding the same operation, and then I take these rows coming out of the end and I apply a determinant, that when I swap two electron positions, what this means is that I'm swapping two rows in the determinant, and the determinant has got the property that if you swap two rows, you get a minus sign. So this will ensure that if I swap two electron positions, the overall wave function will pick up a sign of minus one. So the, to repeat uh, the, the requirement, the way that we implement this symmetry is that we ensure that the, uh, wave, that the uh, neural network uh, is entirely composed of symmetric layers such that uh, the, the matrix will, uh, will swap rows if I swap uh, uh, electron coordinates, and then I apply a determinant which introduces the sign of minus one. So that's supposed to be a GIF showing that, but I hope that I explained it a few times. And there comes the sign of minus one. Uh, in practice, uh, the way that, you know, to, from that principle, you need to actually implement this in practice. And this is a, a, a high-level diagram about how uh, this architecture, Fermi-Net, works. Uh, we have uh, 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 the permutation invariance. The way that it's achieved is that basically you process each uh, one electron uh, stream, each, each feature which depends on the position of one electron only. You process them all, and then you... Uh, average the results for all electrons and concatenate them to each stream, right? So that way, if you swap two, two labels, uh, the, average, the averaging is invariant uh, and the overall operation is uh, uh, covariant with uh, swapping of labels. I hope this makes sense. So, but, um, and this is kind of inspired by uh, work on attention, where you know, uh, attention networks and transformers or whatnot have this property, uh, but also it's inspired by uh, message passing neural networks which have been applied in chemistry and have these nice operation on sets. Uh, and then the place where our, let's say, chemical intuition comes is that, you know, it feels like electron distance should be important information. And so we also, as well as a one electron stream, we have a two electron stream. And the two electron stream is averaged together uh, along each electron dimension and concatenated such that the network can reason about distances between electrons uh, in a more direct way. So this to me is an example of uh, something which intuitively feels like it should be part of the solution and empirically seems to help, but it's not, you know, we're not sort of imposing that uh, uh, electron-electron distances are used in a particular way. Uh, we are just letting the network see this information. Uh, and finally, the learning algorithm. So I think this is an interesting project um, because the, the, the network architecture is interesting, but also the, the, um, the learning is quite different from most machine learning. It doesn't fall easily, easily in the categories. Uh, the main feature of it is that you are learning, but there is no data. There is no data and no simulator. So how does it work? It seems a bit crazy. Well, basically, I said that uh, the, uh, the neural network encodes the wave function. The wave function is the probability of finding electrons. So what you do is that you sample points from the wave function. So you sample uh, positions by Monte Carlo sampling from the wave function. You evaluate the energy for those configurations, and you get a point, right? That's a point that gives you the energy as a function of the parameters of your network. And then you do the usual thing. You minimize 
uh, the, the loss function, the energy with respect to the parameters. You get a new function and you keep going and you keep going until uh, the energy is minimized. And at that point, uh, the wave function, uh, you've, you've obtained a, uh, a variational approximation to the, to the true wave function under the assumption that the wave function takes the form of the neural network you have used. Does this make sense? Okay, and I think it's quite cool because it's like, there's no data, but you're learning stuff. <laughs> uh, so in practice, what can you actually do? Uh, you can, you know, I said before that the exact solutions you could do maybe like 10 electrons. And with this, you can get exquisite uh, uh, accuracy on systems of maybe, this slide is a bit old, so I think we maybe can do a bit more now, but maybe let's say 30, 40, 50 electrons or so. Maybe you can stretch it a little bit further, but for bigger stuff, you're gonna have to do something else. So you're not running, even caffeine with, with 100 electrons would be, uh, uh, would be really hard work. Um, but, you know, does it work? Well, basically I'm telling you, yes, it works. It's, uh, uh, so here's why I'm saying testing is really important. We took our method, which is the, I don't know what this color is, light green. This light green curve, these are, this is the error for several uh, uh, atoms compared with different methods, uh, all complicated acronyms, but these are the methods used in chemistry. Very important thing, this is uh, lower the better, unlike this morning. Uh, so you can see that uh, uh, the green method does much better than all the others. And in particular, the green method is a lot better than this blue curve, which is essentially the exact same algorithm, variational Monte Carlo, but with a, uh, let's say, hand-designed uh, um, um, functional form for the wave function, which is called a slater uh, jastrow factor hartree thing. Uh, so uh, slater jastrow backflow actually, wave function, which is a state-of-the-art method that scientists have come up with using their uh, intuition over the last 100 years. This is the best they could do. With the same algorithm, we can do much better. And why is that? Because the neural network is really uh, a great function approximator. It's very, uh, it's very synthetic. It's very good at like minimizing the loss function. So it does much better than anything that you can come up with. Uh, and this is the most recent work we've applied to say something which has a little bit more real, uh, well, let's say a little bit more impressive application. So that was single atoms. And this is uh, the so-called uniform electron gas, which is the simplest possible model of a solid. It's a box full of, uh, um, full of electrons. Uh, and an interesting thing with this, so the only variable in this problem is how big is the box? You know, how, what is the average density of the electrons? And an interesting uh, feature of this model is that it displays a phase transition so that the electrons act like a liquid in high density and they act like a solid in very low density regime. And the way that usually people model this is because they use a, a hand-designed uh, um, functional form for the wave function, they either have to make a liquid uh, function or a solid function, and they basically have to run both. They have to, and, that's the, and that would be what the, uh, what, so the, the red balls uh, here show you the traditional results assuming you have a, a, a solid, a crystal. Whereas the dashed line is what you get if you assume you have a gas. Uh, and basically they take the lowest of the two, right? But uh, automatically with, uh, uh, with uh, Fermi-Net, you get the correct phase transition where the, uh, the system switches from one to the other. So again, it shows the power of the method, which is that essentially the same uh, functional form that works for atoms, works for molecules, works for solids, works for liquid electrons, works with solid electrons. So my, you know, if I try and draw some lessons from this for uh, machine learning, first, interesting, maybe, I don't know, it's that, you know, this is a problem, a real life problem, if you wish, but it doesn't sit comfortably. It's not supervised learning. It's not unsupervised learning. And I would say it's not RL, but, you know, <laughs> Uh, and then the, the second, you know, so it's, it, it just means there's lots of opportunities for being creative. You know, everywhere there is a function, you can put a neural network and that there's lots of functions everywhere. Um, the second thing is that, you know, this, this central property of neural networks, which is that they're powerful function approximators, 
can be exploited in all sorts of different problems. Uh, the third is about these vital properties. So anti-symmetry is a vital property. If I allowed the network not to be anti-symmetric, I could get unphysical solutions that don't respect the laws of physics. So the only way that I can ensure that the solution is meaningful is by baking this property into the model with this determinant trick. Um, on the other hand, things like um, what features to give to the network, these are kind of a little bit more uh, gut feeling type things. You know, should I feed it information about the electron-electron distances, uh, stuff like this. And there you kind of go with uh, your intuition and you can put and you can let the network use that information how it likes best. Right, so, and then in, in practical results, this work, we published it in 2020. Uh, it's called Ferminet. It was published in Physical Review Research. And the, uh, the high level is that uh, it's demonstrated this really amazing, uh, very high level of accuracy on small systems. And we've got this uh, paper out for phase transitions, which will be in, on Physical Review later soon, if you want to read more about it. Now, the second approach, so this is, the, this is project number two. So now we want to sidestep this exponential scaling altogether. We want to do something else. What are we going to do? Well, let's recap a bit on what we just said. Let's say that we want to study a molecule. What is this? I think it might be methanol. It could be something else. Anyway, whatever this is, it's some molecule. The molecule encodes, uh, uh, it corresponds to a form, one, one instantiation of Schrodinger equation. So I translate it into the equation. Then I train the network, optimize the network to be close to the optimal solution, and I get the energy. Good. But what if somebody gives me a different molecule? Well, I'm going to have to do a different equation now because the number of uh, the you know the, the charge of the protons has changed. So I've got a different equation, different network, different energy, and you can see that this becomes painful because every new molecule I need a new uh, solution, right? Every new molecule is a new problem altogether. Um, and it gets increasingly difficult and increasingly hard to train because the true solution gets more and more complicated the more electrons you have. So wouldn't it be nice if for any atom arrangement you could put it into a single universal network and you could have a faithful quantum mechanical description of the system? So the first question that you, that you uh, well, maybe not everyone, but for me, the first question you want to ask is, is this possible? Does it make sense as a question, or is it a, a hopeless goal which is impossible? And these are sort of scientific questions. Does it exist, and is the method scalable? And then you have to translate this into the machine learning questions. Where will I get the data? What inductive biases can I use? And what I'm going to do next is hopefully answer some of these questions. So does it exist? Now, we said before that uh, in our original sort of wave function approach, like in QMC, the, the bottom line is that you're um, modeling this joint distribution, the wave function, the probability of each electron being at a certain uh, position in space, and that that kind of puts exact methods, tabular methods. We don't even talk about them. Even approximate methods like QMC, you can maybe do 40, 50 electrons. But how about if there was something simpler, like instead of the joint distribution, how about if we just got away with the marginal distribution? So what if I only knew the probability of any electron being at a certain position? Well, that is a much simpler object, right? Because instead of being a 102 times 3 dimensional object, it's just a 3D function, right? It's a function that you give it one input and you get one output. And so in physics, that marginal distribution is called the charge density or the, or the electron density. So does it exist? Is there a black box which takes as input this function? It takes as input the marginal distribution of the position of the electrons and spits you out the energy. Well, first of all, sorry, I forgot my slides. We know that because it just looks at electron density as the input, it is potentially scalable because it does not have this uh, uh, curse of dimensionality in its input. Now we're going to have some unknown machinery, and this is called a functional, you know, if you remember your analysis, because this is a function that takes a function as an input. The charge density is a function, so you have something which takes a function as input and spits out a scalar. That's called a functional. But you can think of it as a function if you like. 
I'm not, I won't get offended. Uh, and does it exist? And it turns out it does exist. Somebody has managed to prove mathematically that the functional does exist and won a Nobel Prize for it. <laughs> uh, so it turns out that what these guys proved is essentially that uh, when you have a molecule, what they got the Nobel Prize for is because they proved that it exists, but they also proved that it's universal. So that this, they proved that if you know the charge density of a molecule, to get the energy, there's some easy bit which depends on the position of the nuclei. That easy bit is really easy to calculate. It's basically the charge density multiplied by the electric field uh, induced by the protons. And then the other bit, which models the interaction between the electrons, is universal. It's the same for every molecule. So the same functional, the same exact functional, will, will be the correct model for all of matter. Whether it's a fictitious gas of electrons, a molecule of caffeine, anything, anything with electrons in it, same functional applies to everything. And you might ask, where does the electron density come from then? Well, they also proved that if you have this uh, magic functional and you minimize the uh, density with respect to the functional, then you get to the true density, right? So in other words, given a functional, you can generate both an accurate energy by passing forward and the density essentially by, we call it back prop, they call it self-consistency. Pardon? Hohenberg and Kohn. And on, I think only Kohn got the Nobel Prize, but he shared it with another quantum chemist. So now the big reveal, what are we going to put in the black box? <laughs> and then the machine learning questions become, you know, at this point, obviously, you know, theoretically, it's all straightforward. You know, this is more or less supervised learning now. Uh, and the question becomes, where do we get the training data and what are the inductive biases? Now, we obviously need to get real, real uh, you know, we need to get targets. You can't, I mean, you can't really do experiments. You sort of can, but it's a can of worms. It's much easier if you can just calculate the right answer. And we can calculate the right answer for small molecules using methods like QMC. So uh, we've sifted through the literature and there's sort of, I don't know, I wrote tens of thousands, but it's more like thousands, if I'm honest, uh, of uh, labeled examples. Uh, and they will basically correspond to a pair of a charge density and a number, the energy of that system of electrons. Uh, but, you know, when our scientists go off and use these methods, they are not going to apply it to the same set of molecules. They are going to apply it to whatever thing that they are imagining. And it's almost certainly going to be outside of the, well outside of the training set. So we're going to have to deal with the fact that the input is going to be training molecules, but it could be applied to some exotic interactions that are not in your model. It could be like, this is, this, this is like a cluster of water molecules, which isn't that exotic, but you know, if they were charged or if they were in an electric field, they could be doing funny things. There could be some large molecule. There could be like solids and crystals. There could be stuff that you haven't seen anything like. And so it's really, really important to think, to take your problem, take everything that you know for sure, and either bake it into the network or, or mold the network to respect the, uh, the principles you want to, um, you want to exploit. So in, this part, in our particular case, uh, the network architecture that we use is, is fairly straightforward. Uh, at a very high level, what we do is that we, as, as I said, this, the, the input is this scalar field, the charge density. So we sample the scalar field on a, on a very large grid. At each position on the grid, we feed in some features of the charge, some local features of the charge density. We go through an MLP with, uh, with a little bit of special tweaks. Uh, and then we produce a set of enhancement factors, produce a set of numbers, uh, which are order one, let's say. And then these numbers get scaled by fixed expressions for the energy, which have been used previously you know, in, the, in the functions that were developed before neural networks. So what are the important inductive biases that we're baking into the problem? 
First of all, rotational and translational invariance. So if I rotate my molecule, uh, all the features remain the same and the model doesn't exploit anything about the coordinates of the points. So that's, that's ticked off. The second is an important one in physics, it's extensivity. This means that if I have uh, molecule A and molecule B and they're well separated, the energy is always just the sum of the two. Because we are processing everything locally, uh, this extensivity is, uh, is automatically um, uh, respected. And which, which useful intuitions are we, are we using? Uh, locality is very import is important, so we're assuming that the, the functional is, is short-sighted. Uh, and this, this isn't written in stone, and some of our features look a little bit around uh, of the charge density, but it's a good, um, a good sort of... Um, a, a good thing to, to, to try and suggest to the network. And also one feature of the problem is that the, these uh, charge densities can vary by orders of magnitudes, the outputs vary by orders of magnitudes. So we, uh, uh, we, we kind of try and get the rough scaling of these local energies right by, by, using, no, by, by trying to not learn the overall scale of the local energy. Uh, and then the other thing to point out, which is, it's not really an, an ML thing, but it's more of a, let's say, engineering uh, or uh, numerical uh, thing, is the grids we use are huge, you know, hundreds of thousands of points, uh, and um, adding hundreds of thousands of points of very different magnitudes is, uh, you have to be very careful uh, because you can lose numerical accuracy quite easily. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of detail goes into making sure that uh, the model works in practice. And there's a second very important uh, ingredient of this, of this paper was um, that I just said that we had maybe like a thousand or so labeled, uh, labeled molecules. Labeling data is quite expensive. Uh, is there anywhere else that we can get data? And basically there is, because there are theoretical properties of the exact functional which are known and which are very hard to impose analytically. So it's not like rotational invariance which you can impose by the structure of the network. There are things which, which it's very difficult to write a formula that respects them. Uh, and what we're going to do is that we're going to take these theoretical properties, we're going to turn them into data, and this kind of has a double whammy, uh, a positive double whammy, one is that it's a source of free data. And two, it allows you to make a functional which respects theoretical properties that are difficult to impose analytically and which therefore will have novel properties, we hope. Uh, and in particular, and this could be an hour long uh, uh, theoretical chemistry lecture of its own, the properties, the theoretical properties I'm talking about uh, are all to do with um, uh, fractional charge. So this is a mathematical concept, the idea of, you know, half an electron or a quarter of an electron, which does, you know, doesn't, um, it's not a physical system, but uh, for the mathematical object, you know how the overall functional should change when you change uh, uh, the charge um, by fractional amounts, and you, you can exploit that, that fact. And the interesting thing is that uh, all most known approximations, and there's two there, B3LIP and LDA, uh, have large errors with respect to this, uh, uh, to, this, uh, to this exact condition, which is the red line. So recapping, we know some things mathematically about the exact solution. Uh, we don't know how to put them in the functional. To be honest, we don't even have a good intuition of what they're about, <laughs> but we do know how to make them into data. And so that turns it into like, uh, from a problem which is about being very smart, i.e. a difficult problem, to a problem about whether the neural network is expressive enough to solve it, which is an empirical, relatively easy problem, I would say. So, I hope to have sort of set out to answer the, the question. The quest we set out on, you know, obviously it's to do these practical things, room temperature, superconductors, batteries, <coughs> fertilizers, etc. We decided that this has got to do with the quantum mechanics of electrons, and we've set out on a quest for this single universal network that will address all of this. Scientifically, it is known that this can exist. It is known that it is scalable. Uh, we know how to get training data. We know how to augment training data with theoretical constraints, 
and we've designed a network which is based on uh, um, reasonable inductive biases of what we understand of the problem as humans. And we've, pu we've published the work. It's pu called Pushing the Frontiers of Density Functionals by Solving the Fractional Electron Problem, which was published in Science uh, last December. Uh, and it's the first general purpose machine learned DFT functional. And it's state of the art. I'll show you some results now. But basically, it's going to be a bunch of graphs where our lines are lower than their lines. Uh, so it's state of the art on a wide range of chemistry. And more importantly, it's solved long-standing systematic errors of existing DFT functionals. So here are our lines. Our lines are the purple ones. And the methods of comparable cost are the dark gray ones. So our lines are lower than their gray lines. And in some cases, our, gray, our purple lines are lower than the dashed lines, which are much more expensive. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, and then the, ne the next problem, again, you know, th this is to say, you know, maybe, maybe I should have actually said something more. If we look at this, uh, at this scale here, this, this number is uh, an error of energy. And it's an, you see that the error here is numbers which are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, stuff like that. Uh, but there are also problems where uh, the non-purple lines, like these dashed lines, say, here have got errors of 30, 40, 50. So this is, the, um, this is the most simple system you would think. It's H2+, two protons and one electron. And all, uh, a lot of methods have got really, really bad errors for these things. And despite that, these are very, very used, very, very used methods. And, you know... They're very used methods. People are not idiots, so they just don't use them on H2+. You know? like, but the point is that by using this uh, special training data, we can impose extra conditions on the functional, so we can really show how the flexibility of the neural network is able to do something that by human design is quite difficult. Uh, and we, solve these, we can do these things like H2+, helium 2 plus, and C2H6+. Plus. These are... They're, see the pattern, they're uh, breaking uh, a charged bond, which is a, if you're a chemist, it's a hemibond, it's half a bond. Breaking half a bond is difficult with DFT. Uh, and on the other side, you've got the, the evil twin sister of that problem, which is breaking a neutral bond without breaking spin symmetry, just for the, for the theoretical chemistry audience. Uh, and you see that the, the dashed lines here are, are higher instead of lower, there's a, a good reason for that, but our methods are, are much closer to, uh, to uh, uh, the ground truth, which is flattening out at, at large distances. So what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is that there, we, we've taken some textbook examples of failures of functionals, and we can address them by, uh, by basically fixing the, the behavior of the functional on these fictitious fractional electron problems. So recap. Two complementary approaches. On the one hand, we've got Quantum Monte Carlo. This uses no training data. It uses a neural network simply as uh, um, the form of the solution of an equation. Uh, and it enables extreme accuracy, but for a small system. On the other hand, we've got the DFA, density functional approximation. You learn a single universal neural network. It's scalable. And it's got the possibility, theoretical possibility of extreme high accuracy. In practice, it's less accurate. How has this work been received? Uh, this is a work by um, Kieron Burke and his colleagues. Kieron Burke is a world expert in DFT who has got hundreds of thousands of citations for the traditional functions that we are trying to, you know, fight against in a scientific, good-natured way. Uh, so the question is, you know, hmm, can ML approaches to DFT approximation significantly outperform human designed ones and solve long standing challenges? Obviously, he's got skin in this game, right? Because he's, he's one of the humans. Uh, and the most recent development comes from DeepMind. Will DFT go the way of Go? And, you know, many researchers all the world are trying it, uh, trying to find problems with it. Uh, and, you know, will it, will, is, this, is this the final solution? Spoiler, I don't think this is the final solution yet, but I hope what it is is that it is a first step towards the solution and it kind of opens this interesting possibility 
this interesting opportunity for what does it even mean for quantum mechanics to be solved in the way that we can say Go is solved. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>